Welcome, everyone. My name is Jeline Jackson, and we're with Moms for America. Today, we'll be discussing our cottage meeting number nine, A Time to Sew, kind of that wonderful, beautiful precept and principle uh, found in the Bible of kind of the law of harvest, things that we're sowing right now in our home, hoping for a, a wonderful reaping of, of uh, harvest at some point. Well, like I said, my name is Julene Jackson. I've been involved with Moms for America for about eight to 10 years now. I have five children, ages 25 on down to 12. We have three millennials and then two, a 17-year-old and a 13-year-old at home. Uh, I love Moms for America. We believe that liberty begins at home. If moms and grandmas aren't teaching certain ideas and principles and stories, who will? I don't think we can count on the schools anymore to teach these ideas, these values, these principles that made America great and which our nation was founded on. And so we call these meetings, uh, women coming together, cottage meetings. They're kind of like Tupperware, but like Tupperware or um, a meeting for liberty. You know, we're discussing, we're teaching, we're sharing ideas and experiences. And always we go home with ideas and ways which we can shore up the four walls of our homes. Now, typically you would gather a few moms in your neighborhood or in your community and you'd meet maybe once a week or once a month and you would use this beautiful resource called the Cottage Meeting Manual that you can get at our website momsforamerica.us or on Amazon. And it has 12 lessons and they take you right through it so beautifully. So you don't have to be an expert in any of these ideals and principles and histories and, and teachings. You can just kind of follow the outline and have lead the discussion. Since the pandemic, we decided now's a great time to go virtually go online and kind of model and mirror what a cottage meeting in a home would typ typically look like. And so we've been doing it for the last nine weeks. I've got my dream team here, Vivian from Texas. She has two girls, a millennial and then a 13 year old. Jessica from New York has a 11 year old son and a nine year old daughter. And then let's see, who else do we have down there today? Sandy uh, is a former um, principal of a, of a high school or middle school. Tell us. Uh, yes, uh, both. Um, I was a teacher, uh, an assistant principal, a principal, a counselor. And so I've gone through all steps of education. Oh my word. A a mother, are you a grandmother too? Do you have grandchildren? Yes, I am. I, I am the mother of uh, twin boys that are now grown and married. And Chris has two little ones, a seven year old. Okay. And a four -year -old. So, Very exciting for me. So, a woman with a lot of life experience in the home and outside of the home. That is amazing teaching the, the youth of America and, and understanding them behind the scenes of the school administration. Beautiful. And then we've got Nellie Riggs, and then we've got one other cute mom down here that I see. Do you wanna, what, what's your name? Kate. 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 Hi. Welcome. Hi, Kate. Is this your first time with us on the cottage meeting? It is, I watched your last one uh, last night. Okay, oh, great, we're so, we're so glad to have you. Are you a mother or are you thinking you have a few children if you're with us today? Yep, I have uh, I have three kids, 16, 14, and 11. Oh, wonderful, right? At those great ages when they're starting to figure life out and have all the answers to things. Aren't you lucky? It's a lot of fun. We, we uh, did a lot of years in youth ministry, so I'm actually bent towards teenagers. So these, these are fun years. Yeah, I, I kind of like teenagers myself because uh, the way they develop in their ideas and opinions <laughs> Are wonderful. I, I like the challenge of a teenager, yeah. but they can come with challenges as well, and that's okay. We're up to the task. We are up to the task, mothers and grandmothers. So always in a cottage meeting when we meet in a home, we have someone offer a prayer and say the pledge, just to invite the Spirit of God to be with us because we need God right now at this time in our country to know how to raise this rising generation so that they will love freedom and liberty in America the way we do. So I've asked Jessica if she'd offer a prayer and then lead us in the pledge. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this time that we can come together right now. 
Lord, we just pray that you would open our our hearts, open our uh, minds to understand and to learn what we're going to study today, God. We just pray um, that you would be with all of those that are listening, Lord, with the concerns upon their own heart and their life that they're going through and their family, Lord God. Everyone representing different states, Lord, we're facing different challenges or uh, limitations within um, our state during this pandemic, Lord God. And, and like Julian said, we need you, Lord. So we pray that you will speak to us during this time. And we pray, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. That beautiful prayer. Okay, if we could all stand for a pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much, ladies, and for that beautiful prayer, Jessica. I really do believe I'm going to talk a little bit about the power of a little prayer in our lives today. So... Um, we're on our ninth lesson, and like I said, this is, will be one of the greatest resources you will have, the Cottage Meeting Manual. It has stories, it has quotes, it has scriptures, it has links to videos and other resources to build your library of freedom. So it's, I think it's about $16. I've used it for so many years. It's been on, sat on the lap of uh, my knees in the early morning when I taught my little devotional to my children and in my jammies, and I've carried it all over the country as I've spoken to different groups. It's just a great resource. And this is what we'll be taking our lesson nine from today, A Time to Sew. Last week, we talked about capturing the sunshine in our children's lives through art and literature and music to foster uh, a greater love for liberty. And today, we're talking about a time to sew, these small things that we do in our home that we wonder if they're really going to amount to anything and if they're going to pay off at some point. And this is where I think the faith comes in when you plant a garden. You plant these little seeds and you hope something is going to sprout. And so I love this quote by Ronald Reagan, our 40th president during the 80s. He said, like when all great change in America at the top of page 151 of our Cottage Meeting Manual, he says, all great change in America begins at the dinner table. Isn't that an interesting concept? And this is, we're gonna talk a little bit about this and some other things like this in our home today. We're going to talk our purpose of the power of the dinner hour, as well as time and home management ideas and the value of quality time as a family. So this biblical principle of the law of harvest, we're on page 151 of our cottage meeting manual right now. This, this law of the harvest suggests that if we take the time to teach our children and our grandchildren certain things today, we will reap the benefits of tomorrow. And that quality family time can just be found in these small and simple things. We don't have to spend a lot of money. They don't have to be elaborate ideas or projects or trips. And the family dinner hour is a simple but profound opportunity to have discussion and to teach our children. So let's turn the page of a cottage meeting manual to page 152. And always before we begin our lessons, they give us uh, an idea of some presentation resources, other books, other ideas, books you can use to augment this subject. And I always recommend buying one or two of these books off Amazon or, af or off of our momsforamerica.us um, org no, dot us website and this first book is they recommend is called table talk sampler i have used this book for years it's just a simple little small little book you can get it uh on our website you can get it on amazon in the kindle version and it's just 30 days of stories and quotes and questions that you can use at the dinner table oh there you go so it has a different, it's the same thing, but it, it, that just has a different cover. Yeah, that's it. By Kimberly Fletcher, who is the uh, president and founder of Mom America. She wrote this book. And I've used it 
the, so the first half of the book t- explains the power of the family dinner hour and kind of the history of, of, of this. And then the last half of the book are different quotes and stories and scriptures that you would read and then just have a discussion. So you're having, you know, if you're wondering what to talk about, you know, is it the same thing, you know, at the dinner table or has it gotten a little stale or does everyone wolf down their food and then split as fast as you can? This is such a great idea just to read a little story, to read a little quote. To, you know, one of the questions is, would you rather live in the city or the country? If you owned a zoo, what, were, what are five animals that you would want? You know, I mean, these kind of cute things. And then there's some beautiful patriotic stories that are short that would, um, you know, initiate an interesting discussion or interesting scripture. What does this mean to you? What does this principle in the scripture, you know, how would this look at school? How would you apply this at school? That kind of thing. So a great book. I I really recommend this book. The next book that they recommend is The Food Nanny Rescues Dinner. I'm telling you, I did this, uh, her program for a few years, and it was such a hit. So what she does is she, um, she, she, she has uh, theme nights for her for the the week. So she has like on Monday she would um, have comfort food. Tuesday would be Italian night. Wednesday would be fish or breakfast. Thursday Mexican. Friday grilled. Saturday maybe maybe Saturdays homemade pizza uh, and maybe I've mixed these up here. And then Sunday would be like a traditional and what a, a traditional meal like pot roast, mashed potatoes, and gravy. And then she has a little template where you can print out online and and then you write in Monday, Tuesday, and you write in what you're going to have and you put it on the refrigerator so the kids can see and begin to salivate already in anticipation of, ooh, I want to be there this night. We're going to have homemade cornbread and chili kind of thing. So I actually did this. I actually went to um, a little uh, seminar that she taught and I was so intrigued by the way, and she comes, has a large family and her her recipes are really yummy. And um, to be honest with you, her zucchini bread, her pumpkin bread and her banana bread, our underbreads are legendary. I've given them out to people in my neighborhood for years and people love them. So the recipes are yummy recipes. Now I went vegan a few years ago, so I had to alter some of her recipes, but the, the, the recipes in this book Families love them. And so I just, uh, and then and then she talks about in the beginning of the book, you know, families that eat together, the children have better nutrition, better language, literacy, fewer eating disorders, fewer riskier behaviors. Kids that eat less than two to three times a week with their family. Teens who have fewer than three family dinners per week, she says, are two and a half times likely to smoke cigarettes. They're more than one and a half times likelier to drink alcohol and almost three times likelier to try marijuana. Mealtimes become a way for families to bond. It shows kids that they have access to a caring adult. So she talks a little bit about the value of eating together. And then, and then this idea of posting. So that means you do have to prepare ahead the week. And you have to kind of itemize. But, you know, sometimes half the battle with knowing what to fix is we just like run out of ideas. But if you know Monday nights are comfort nights and Tuesday nights are Italian night and then Wednesday nights are fish or breakfast night, Thursday nights are Mexican night, it's, it doesn't seem as hard for the mother to come up with ideas when you kind of have this theme. And so um, anyways, I really like that book. Obviously, you can tell I like this book. So the next resource they talk about is A House United and Teaching Self-Government by Nicolene Peck. Now, I know Kimberly has attended her seminars. Nicolene Peck has a great system for teaching self-government and home management, and I don't have the book with me. I knew I had it, but I just couldn't find it. She has a great website. Several years ago in England, there was a real popular reality TV show called The World's Strictest Parents. And what they would do, but they would take rebellious British teenagers and they would put them in homes around the world that kind of have completely different traditions and cultures. And these parents would try and, you know, get these kids 
these rebellious British teenagers to fly straight. So Nicolene was on this, the second season of this show, and it was the highest watched program that year in um, England. I remember uh, her telling me about it. I know Nicolene actually personally. So it's 55 minutes and I watched it with my children and it was so powerful as she incorporated her expertise in teaching children self-government and worth. And so I'd really recommend Googling World's Strictest Parents, Nicolene Peck, Utah, second season, and it will come up and you can watch it with your children. And it's a really, we, it was, it was just, we were mesmerized by the show. And so, and the, the two young teenagers that come to her home, they're difficult. And at the end, it, I mean, we were all just crying and weeping. It was so sweet. So put that on your list of things to watch since we're all watching a little bit more TV these days. And so anyways, these are just some good recommendations uh, for you. And I really can highly recommend all three of them. So um, mamas and grandmothers, let's turn the page to 154 at the very top. The question is asked, how can problem solving at a family level contribute to strong local self-government? Why is it important to the preservation of liberty? So one of our primary resources we use in our cottage meeting is this 5,000 year leap book. And this is the very first book that I studied when I began to attend the cottage meetings. We about five moms got together once a month and we would study a few of these 28 principles of liberty that our founding fathers use these ideas to, to, um, to form this nation. And so the, the, there's 28 principles. And you've heard me say, I actually memorize these 28 principles because they're powerful, they're truth. And they're the best, they're, are, they're my best armor and tools when I'm having a conversation with someone that a lot of their ideas are based on emotion. If I, I use one or two of these principles and it kind of changes the tone of the conversation. So the 21st principle in this book says that strong local self-government is the keystone to preserving human freedom. And if you turn to the 21st principle on page, let's see, what page is that? 235. Yeah, page 235, thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Um, the very first paragraph says there, the centralization, this is the 5,000 year leap, page 235, 21st principle. It says the centralization of political power always destroys liberty by removing the decision-making function from the people on the local level and transferring it to the officers of the central government. This process, isn't this fascinating? Listen to this. This process gradually benumbs the spirit of volunteerism amongst the people, and they lose the will to solve their own problems. They also cease to be involved in community affairs. They seek the anonymity of oblivion in the seething crowds of the city and often denigrate into faceless automatons who have neither a voice nor a vote. Isn't that interesting? So the same concept that the best place to solve the problems within your home is within your home. You don't need to go to the schools. You don't need to go to the courts. You don't need to go to the psychiatrist. You can probably solve a lot of your problems just around the dinner pit table. And that same idea that strong local self-government is the best way to ensure freedom at all levels. So how do you see this played out today? Are you seeing the spirit of volunteerism being benumbed within your neighborhoods and communities? Are you seeing this being played out today as we look to Washington, DC, thousands of miles away to solve our problems? How do you see that today? Are you seeing the opposite of, of what this principle is, is encouraging us to do? You know, I don't, I live in a very big city. One of, I think we're in the top eight in the country. So we have close to 2 million people in the city and the surrounding area. And we have our local election. I'm actually in the county, so I don't get a vote in the, in the city election. <clears throat> but it's about 28,000 people 
that come out and elected our crazy liberal mayor. And it's people not being active, not volunteering, not coming out to vote that have put us in a very, very precarious situation. Sandy knows this because she lives in my same city. And I mean, when you're talking a population of nearly 2 million, and like I said, not all of us can vote because some are county, but only 28,000 are, are voting and choosing for 2 million. That's terrible. You know, it's like we have to get more involved. And even if you're not in the city, if you live in the county like I do, I'm still very much involved in local elections and, you know, the courthouse. I think people don't understand how important the judges are. It's very important that people get out and learn who these judges are and elect them at the local level because they're very, very powerful. And our school boards, you know, the school boards, as our president, Kimberly Fletcher, usually says, it's the most powerful elected, uh, elected position in the country. And I think you can see right now really how it's never been more true than what we're going through. And we need parents to get involved, to contact their school board and their city officials to, to stop what's going on and not expecting them to, to take care of our problems. We need to protect ourselves, protect our families, but allow moms to make those choices to do that. And it, it all becomes with being a, a good citizen, being an active citizen. And I always, you know, I've said it before, to me, the most important job I have as a mom is to raise a good citizen. Because to me, that, that encompasses absolutely everything when you have a good citizen. So I think that's probably the first thing we need to do. And where, do that, where does that happen? Around the dinner table planting those small seeds into our children. And I think that's what we have to do more. So I think this topic this week is so incredibly relevant that you may not see that change right now, especially if you have the younger kids, but hopefully they're going to grow with these seeds that we planted and they're going to be activists and good citizens. Yeah. Julene, if I may inter interject there, um, mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson said, um, those wards called townships in New England are the vital principle of their governments and have proved themselves the wisest in in invention ever devised by the wit of man for the perfect exercise of self-government or for its preservation. Um, William Penn also felt the same when he came to America and was given a mass amount of land by the King of England. He came and he, he gave uh, the local townships and the, and the American natives there um, a letter stating that he would not intervene in their, in their local principles or jurisdictions, that he had no, um, no interest in disrupting what they had already established as landowner. And so he left them to their own, um, their own self-government, if you will. So it's a principle that's been starting from since the beginning that is vital. And, and even look in the Bible with Moses, when he set up government within Israel, he had, you know, at the most basic level of the pyramid, you know, families of 10, then 50s, then 100s, then thousands. But the most of the problems were addressed at that local level and only the really hard ones got to him. And, and, and when we, when we just assume that we can't solve our problems and just immediately look to, you know, the government or the governor or Washington DC, there's something about the benumbing spirit that we don't even begin to think we can solve our problems. So instead of looking to God to deliver us and to have a counsel in your family and to get on your knees and ask God to help us with this, this child or this situation, we, we have a tendency to then want to just look to the government to deliver us. And that definitely then our freedom is at stake huh? when we begin. Right, to right. And then, but we're talking about two, two very important principles here. There's the principle of self-government where um, in First Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 5, it says, if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how, he, how will he take care of the church of God, right? So it's about self-individual 
self-control, right? Be slow to anger, um, you know, um, how to control your mind, what comes into your mind. Um, and then there's the local self-government where, where Thomas Jefferson talked about the townships, how local control, and coming from um, the Utah State Board of Education, I always taught that to me, local local control meant between the teacher and the parent. I don't know how much local control you can get. The state doesn't know your child. It doesn't know your situation. And neither, frankly, does the district. But at, at a school level, um, talking with the principal, talking with the teacher, you can then um, devise a plan specific for that child, which in a public situation, it's, it's very hard because it's, you know, less funds to go around. But but I think with more um, individual attention, you can solve a lot, a lot more problems. Exactly. And that's exactly what we're talking about with this 21st principle. Thank you so much, Lisa and Vivian. So, you know, we never need to look further than the, the word of God to try and figure out what to do. So just look there at, under the scriptures that they recommend. The question is asked on page 154 in the middle. Most parents agree that leading and directing a family can be an, a daunting and overwhelming task. Amen. So how can the principles of self-government help parents lead their families towards stability and freedom? And look at the beautiful scriptures there, Vivian, if you could just pull up the scriptures that they recommend we look at in Proverbs 22. God tells us, train up a child in the way that he should go. If you won't depart from it, if you teach a child responsibility and commitment in the home, he will naturally want to bring those attributes out into his community and society. In Genesis 18, 19, he will command his children and households to keep the way of the Lord. So have them be, have the word of God be their measuring stick of how to proceed, what to do, what is right, what is wrong. Proverbs 24, 3, through wisdom, a house is built by understanding it is established. And you teach under understanding and morals and values and wisdom in the home. Joshua 24, 15. I love it. I think I've got the, can you see it? Oh, you can't see it. But right above me is this quote from Joshua. As for me and my house, we will serve God. And so these are beautiful principles and concepts of parents as we kind of wonder, you know, what, what do we do? What does it look like? God will help us. I love this uh, book here. Again, The House United, right below these beautiful scriptures. Um, she's got a website. I, I would recommend going to that website with ideas about teaching principles of self-government. So in my home for probably a decade, my little system of self-government, we called it, we had a family council one night, commitment to excellence. And it is how the kids had their little, they, they learned money management, the value of the dollar and the value of doing chores. And each week, this is Mary Alice, who's now a junior in college. This is her little book. I found it and I almost just wept when I opened it up. And here's her little handwriting because sometimes I've let them decide what their little weekly chores would be. Clean my room, study the scripture, practice violin, water the plants, do the chore of the day that mom asks, memorization, and each day she charted, and at the end of the week, they got 25 cents for each check, and she'd tell me how much I owed her, and then uh, Monday, or actually, when was it? Monday would be payday for the following week, and so they'd have to pay 10% to tithing, 20% to savings, and the rest of the money was theirs, and she earned this week $21, which is not bad for 10 years ago, and so it taught them, uh, you know, how to budget their little monies, and to be honest with you all my we did this for years our little commitment to excellence and I had to you know I would fill it up I'd Xerox the fresh copies they'd write in their little chores they tally it out and um, to be honest with you my kids have always wanted to work they've always wanted their own uh, freedom and independence and I wonder if some of this little self-government our little program commitment to excellence was a part of that. And so this is what it looked like in my home. So I love our wonderful book. I hope you have it. It's one of our resource uh, resources that we use for a cottage meeting, Raising the Next Generation of Patriots, a Garden Allegory. 
And in the very last chapter, I love this little parable uh, of a struggling tree in the final chapter of this book. And it serves as a parable for preserving liberty. So if we could turn to page 72 of this book, Raising the Next Generation of Patriots. And I think there's a slide that goes along with that, Vivian. And I love this quote by Abraham Lincoln, where he says, an invisible power greater than the puny efforts of men will fight for us. And I think that's sometimes what we feel like we're doing in our home. Is this puny little thing that I'm trying to incorporate, is it really going to make any difference with my kids? And so this parable on page 72 of this book uh, talks about Tammy Hulse, one of the authors of this book, wonderful woman. She said they moved to Minnesota and they moved into their first home and they planted their first tree, which was a martial ash. And then on page 73, it says that they cared for it, they fertilized this tree. And then four years into the birth of this little tree, the planting, there was a terrible Halloween blizzard 30 inches of snow were dumped. And then that, that Thanksgiving, there was another terrible Thanksgiving blizzard that left a record breaking amounts of snow. And it was one of those particularly harsh Minnesota winters. So when the spring came on page 74, the snow melted, they discovered that the small animals had taken refuge from the cold at the base of the snowbank and that the bulls had just wreaked havoc in her yard and that the bark of that little tree that is now four years old had become their food supply and there was now a 10 inch gap in the bark and, and the trunk of that tree that was exposed. So the lifeline of that little tree had been severed and the branches were not getting any strength from that root. And so they went to the local nursery uh, near their home to try and figure out, can we save this tree? And they were encouraged to do a bridge graft. Has anyone ever done this with a tree? Where they cut off the, the growth, the best growth, off the ends of the branches from the year before. And then you graft it into the trunk at the top and the bottom of the gap. And it creates a bridge for the nutrients to flow. Is, did you even know that was possible? It seems like a long shot, but they did it because they had just devoted four years to the growth of this tree and they didn't want to lose it. And so they did it and they said it didn't look too good for the first couple of seasons. I mean, anyone passing by that tree would have definitely thought that tree was a goner, that it was a dead tree. And so at the bottom of 76, they decided to really do something crazy. We loved this tree and we didn't want to start over again. So we knew that its survival might only be a matter of prayer. <laughs> That's the only thing they could think of. So their little family prayed over this tree. They said that if the, creator, if the Lord who is the creator of all things notices even a little sparrow that falls, maybe he would be able to heal our tree. Now, can you imagine having that conversation at the dinner table with your children? And guess what? They prayed, and for a few seasons, the tree looked sparse, but it lived. And wouldn't you know, over the years, as that tree grew into full maturity, it was healthy, and you would have never known that it had a near-death experience. And the only uh, remains was just a small little scar where the graft had taken place at the base of the root, the trunk of that tree. And so on page 78, I love how it talks about that the cause of freedom has always only been championed by just a few, that by great things, by small and simple things, this is usually how God does his work. And often, you know, many of the principles that we talk about in these cottage meetings seem really maybe a little too simple to this seemingly sea of complex problems that our children, our families, our nations are um, facing right now. But, you know, some people would go there, uh, what you're talking about in these cottage meetings are a little too simple, but it says here, she, she writes, the word simple, don't let simple fool you. These solutions are simple, but they are not easy, really. They require dedication, commitment, and consistency, but most of all, they require a belief that they will work. This family believed that if they prayed over their tree, maybe God in heaven could heal it. 
So, you know, as you think about this story as kind of a parable uh, for liberty, what parts of this story can be likened to the struggle for liberty today that we're seeing in our communities, in our homes, in our, our neighborhoods, and how we're trying to revive this love of liberty in the hearts of our young people? What parts of this story can be likened to the struggle that we're having now with our younger generations to revive this love of America. Do you see any interesting similarities or analogies to this little parable here and, and what is going on in your homes with your children or grandchildren and your friends' friends? What, I, what I'm seeing is, is a lack of belief in God. Like in the story, they, they, they put their faith in God to heal the tree, right? But, the, but when there's a vacuum, uh, void of, of God, then it's filled with a different belief. And that's the belief in government and the growth of government. And I need to be looked after by government. Um, James Madison, uh, when he was president, said, we have staked the whole future of American civilization, not on the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future of all polit political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, and sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. I mean, it all comes down to the belief of God sustaining what he has written in the Bible, in the scriptures, and uh, how we have taught that or not ta taught that to our children um, uh, reflects in our social environments today. I, I love that. When things look their very worst, is that when our children know to drop to their knees and petition God for help? Well, drop to their knees and, and not for a, a cause, but for a, a, an eternal cause, if I, if I may. Yeah. So, you know, in the, the 5,000 year leap, the 26th principle says the core unit that determines the strength of any society is the family. Therefore, the government should foster and protect its integrity. Our founders knew the success of this nation would be based on the strength of the family. And how do we get strong families? We spend quality time together. I love in the promises of the Constitution at the page of the top of page 155 of our cottage meeting manual. It refers to some of the vignette, vignettes of the promises of the, of the Constitution. And they're just page and a half little vignettes and ideas that you can read to your children. Uh, and the vignettes, it says here, 13.3, 13.4, 13.5, 13.7, and, and 14.5, all talk about this quality time as a family. And on page 286, vignette 13.3, it talks about prayer is like one of the core components to quality family life. The strength that comes to a family that prays together. Now, for years, we've prayed with our five children in our home before they take off in the morning. We all will kneel, and before we go to bed at night, we gather all the kids for a family prayer. And for so many years, we would kneel, and we would hold hands when we pray. Then we started this funny little tradition that dad would squeeze someone to the side of him and then they'd squeeze the next person and the squeeze would go around the circle. And then we'd all put our hands in the middle and we'd go, sure, love ya. And that was our prayer. And it's so cheesy and it's so corny, but there was a years in our family that it worked. And now when my kids are grown and they come home and we pray, sometimes we still do that corny little squeeze and that sure love you. And something as simple as that, I think just speaks comfort and stability and security in their hearts to know that they come from a family that is not perfect, but we love God and we love each other. And so these simple little things like gathering a family to pray morning and night. And half the times we were like someone was 
fighting with someone just before we said the prayer, you know, and we said, sure, love you, got up, and we're still fighting. But it's, it's just amazing as you just consistently do these simple little things like a prayer. And my kids nowadays, they're not perfect kids, but they are praying kids. I know that. So I love 13.4 talks about some ideas for family time together. 13.5, vignette 13.5 talks about studying the word together as a family. Make the Bible stories the backbone of your family time Remember, we talked about getting this book, The Story Bible, that presents the simple stories of the Bible in kind of chronological order, and it, but it still maintains that beautiful kind of old world language, so kids are comfortable with the language of the Bible. So this is a great resource to teach Bible stories to your kids. And so I just really like some of the ideas it gives us about quality family time. So let's get into our supplemental uh, stories that talk a little bit more about family. It's about time. So turn to page 156 in our cottage meeting manual. Let's just talk about, well, what does quality family life look like to you? So at the very top of page 156, it says, yes, we are living in a face Face a, a fast-paced world with busy schedules and oftentimes as mothers we just feel like we're taxi drivers for a few years in our kids lives and with you know everything that we're asked to do finding time for the family can be difficult but it reminds us we don't need to spend a lot of money we don't need to make a, a big elaborate plans or go long distances to spend time with each other uh oh, can you see me? Really, in order to spend more time together as a family, we just need to reevaluate how we spend our personal time and reevaluate maybe our expectations of the time that we have when we're together. Quality time doesn't need to be complicated. It can be as simple as just having a conversation while you're setting the table with one of your children or taking a walk around the block with the dog and the child. The more time we spend as a family, the more well-adjusted our children, our grandchildren will be, and the better citizens they just naturally will become. And there are studies to prove this. So I love some of the ideas on page 156 of quality family time. Lest you think you're not having quality family time, you might be surprised because all of us do these things. Have a family night, play board games, have a pizza movie night, bring your favorite soda, um, uh, do a home project together, paint a room together. I just painted a room with my 17 year old on Saturday and um, we didn't talk a lot, but there's just something about being together that was, was great. So it didn't, I, we didn't really even, you know, have a lot of conversation, but just doing a service project or a project is, is fulfilling. Make dinner together as a family, attend concerts, sporting events, have a special breakfast, go all out, make, make everything they love, pitch a tent in the backyard, go camping, go for a nature walk or hike, do a movie marathon. My older kids love to do that when they come home. They get out all their favorite Star Wars or favorite series of something and they'll watch movies for hours. I can usually do about one movie. They can do four. But they're all together with the bowls of popcorn. And it's great. Read together. Do Zoom little Zoom conferences together. I do that with my kids now on Sunday night. We have our Zoom, you know, little scripture study together and their kids. I mean, I've got one kid, he steps off the basketball court to do his little Zoom with the family and, you know, the kids that are on the West Coast. And, and that's great. Go places, do things together, libraries, zoos, museums, and um, let the kids plan. Let them plan, make a little poster board and what are the things we want to do for all the weekends of this month or a few times this month, have a family council and they can fill in some of the activities. And then it reminds us to take a camera, wherever you go, make sure you take a camera. And I'm sure you girls have done this, but you can like, you know, send all your pictures in and, and out they will send you books of little adventures. So we have lots of these little books through the years of things that we've done. And I will find the 25 year old when she comes home looking at these books. So moms and grandmas, what have been some of the quality time that you have had with your children and grandchildren just this last week? You don't even have to think any further back than seven days ago. What have been some things that you've done that you were like, 
that was sweet. That, that had a good impact. I, there was a good feeling there when I did this or that with this child. Give us an example of what some quality family life just last week in your family looked like. Well, yesterday I did Brielle's hair. She's, you know, she's 13 and she's a little stir crazy right now. And so she's wanted to color her hair and I'm like, it's hair color. It's not a big deal, you know? So the night before, you know, she's half black. So she, her hair is, is pretty curly, you know, um, it's a nice mix between the ethnicities, but it's very difficult to get through. So I'm like, okay, if you're gonna, if we're gonna color your hair the night before, you're gonna need to really brush it out. So we did that the night before. She washed it and I blow dried it and straightened it. So then yesterday, you know, we did the hair color and then afterwards, you know, I blow dry her hair, which is a great because she usually doesn't want you to mess with her hair, you know. So that was nice, and it's simple, but it was just some nice bonding time with her, okay. you know, and yeah. it doesn't have to be anything crazy, and I know she just, she just wants family time. She just wants to be, and it doesn't matter what it is, you know, for her birthday sometimes, she's like, I just wanted to be family. I just, you know, I don't need anything more than that, and I think that's really special, you know? That it could be something so simple. That, that's exactly what we're talking about. Jessica, with your 11-year-old son and 9-year-old daughter, what was something you've done the last few days that felt like a quality experience together? Well, um, you know, it, it's August, new month. So I thought, okay, we really, I was starting to feel guilty. Like, you know, all the things that they've missed this year, whether it's camp or different festivals that we would go to and I just was like oh my gosh I feel like we're not doing anything so I made it my mission like all right we're gonna do these outings and um so my son likes the golf so on Monday we all went golfing even though my daughter's you know she's not thrilled about it but it was an adventure because you know we were we stopped in the halfway house and they found like a raccoon in the garbage can so that was like a big you know, like hullabaloo. So it just, you know, making memories and stories like that. And then yesterday we actually went blueberry picking and same sort of thing. We kept on trying to go blueberry picking like since last week and we would pull up to some place and then it would be closed or we'd go to another place and it would be closed. And like, finally we found a place that was open. It was really, it was really cool because they actually um, also build tree houses as well. So you go blueberry picking, but there's these tree houses in the woods and then there's like ropes course in the woods. Oh and, my word. And it was like, it felt like a vacation, but we were only, you know, 20, 30 minutes away. And then we stopped in the little village and got smoothies and, and uh, it's just like a couple hours, but like it makes your day, you know, it's like, oh, you just, Otherwise, it's like they're trying to call their friends or on video game and, and it's it's a struggle, you know, so yeah. and they're bigger. So as they get bigger, it's like all those little activities like the zoo and stuff like that is kind of right. like below them. So you got <laughs> you to gotta get a little creative. I mean, with my millennials, they'd like me to take them to get their nails and toes done and to get a blowout and, you know, whatever it takes. But Sometimes it's just as simple as walking the dog with me. You know, yeah. they just want that hour talk with mom. So, um, Sandy, as a grandma, what what do you do? I know I don't know if your grandchildren live in town or not, but what do you try and do in the, the last few days or a week to have a connection with uh, your children, grown children, or those grands? We're very blessed because our both our boys that are married, live here in town, and so my grandchildren are here and just about three miles away. So any chance that they, there's uh, Christopher and Emily are the ones that have the two little ones, and any time that they both work, so any time they can, in order to have some time together or, or one has a meeting and the other one is at work, I get the kids. So we spend a lot of time with, with the children. This time during the pandemic, not so much, you know, and, and we're beginning to get together again because it's a lot safer. So that's something that I always enjoy. 
we read books, we tell stories, and um, I always make it a point to teach Spanish to them. So they, they know their numbers and they know certain words, and so we practice that. And when we have a snack, they come to the table. We sit at the counter. And so we're, we don't eat anywhere else other than the counter because that's, that way they're on you know, one side of the counter, I'm on the other side, and we have a little lesson or we can tell a little joke. So that's always very special. Those those kids are just so special to us as as anybody would be if they're grandchildren. But something else that um, a few months ago, um, the we all talked about the the boys and the wives, and and we talked about how time flies. And I say, as you get older, time goes faster. It's just very fast. And so um, one of my sons one, one day called me up uh, about a month ago or two months ago. And he said, um, and they are both in real estate. Chris and Steven are both in real estate. And they have their own group of, of, of realtors you know, together, a group. They're doing very, very, very well. They're very hardworking. They're very personable. They're smart. So they, I'm very proud of them, but they work a lot. And so we talked about that, you know, now that my husband and I, we still have our company and we still work, but not like before. We don't, so we have more time and we're kind of missing that, we were saying. And so uh, uh, one of them, Stephen decided that he would not work as realtors. You have to work almost every day. If you want to show a house, if you want to meet with a client and all. So he just put a, a schedule to, for himself and said, I'm not working on, on Sundays and I'm not, I'm not working in the evening certain times. But the special thing for me is he said, and every Thursday morning, mom, I want to have breakfast with you. Mm. So then Christopher comes along and Emmy, Stephen's wife comes along, so every Thursday morning we have uh, breakfast together, and so we talk to we talk about things. And these are the things that I'm that I'm hearing y'all share with me that I will be bringing up consistently because all of these things are so important. Just like teaching manners, teaching um, Spanish, teaching different things, and especially teaching about God. So both my grandchildren went to a little school, began in a, in a faith-centered school. So I didn't have to worry about that so much. They know God, and they talk about God, and they tell stories about God. So those are the special things that we do. And uh, my husband will get away for our breakfast when he can, because when one of us has to be tending to our business. Thank you. Great, great ideas. Um, so we feel very blessed. Thank you so much. So I want to share with you something yesterday. It's a little bit different uh, concept or way of looking at quality family time. Because um, a lot of the moms and family members and friends that I have are very worried about their millennials right now, their teenagers and the millennials that are being very influenced by social media and, and social un uh, unrest and social justice and that kind of thing. So my little 22-year-old nephew a few days ago, maybe, maybe a week ago or so, um, you know, dyed his hair pink and, and got a, a new tattoo. And my brother was just, you know, devastated because he's worried about this kid, not in college right now and in a rock band and works, you know, a, a, works a job. And he was just discouraged by this. And he actually saw it on a posting of his on Instagram. And, and so I just saw this boy about a week ago at a family reunion. So maybe he had just done it about, I don't know, two weeks ago. And I just love him. He's just got one of these great spirits. But you can just tell he's just trying to figure out who he is and where he fits in, like so many young people today. And so he actually told his parents a few days ago, and he doesn't live at home, that he was going to go to one of the protests uh, in Utah. And I read about this protest because it was in a wealthy neighborhood and it turned violent and there were arrests and there was fisticuffs and altercations with the police. 
And, um, and so the very next day he came home and he was talking to his mother. And so the, um, my sister-in-law and me texted back and forth and she's telling me this yesterday on the text. And my brother is also on this text. And she said, and my, my brother piped in on the text and he said, I was just so discouraged and tired. I just went to bed. I just didn't even want to deal with it because this is a family that, you know, have, have prayed together and have done church and they've taught, you know, scripture and they've tried to do everything they could, you know, to, to give these kids a good foundation. And, and the children are good kids, but they're a little lost right now. And so the mother, uh, my sister-in-law, she texted me and she said, he came home the next day and I had a good talk with him. And I mainly just listened to him and asked him questions. I am worried, but he has good intentions and doesn't totally buy into everything that's going on at these protests. He needs to feel safe, loved and valued and heard at home so that he will want to come back again. Otherwise, I fear we will completely lose him. All he really wants is acceptance, and that's where he's finding it, I guess, at these rallies, or at least the illusion of it. And when that illusion fades, I want him to feel welcome with us at home. And I thought that was so powerful because that was a quality ex discussion and exchange she had with the child that she's probably not real thrilled about his involvement right now with this protest. But the fact that he wanted to come home the next day and just kind of talk it through with her is powerful. And she didn't even lecture him about, you know, the right or wrong of it. She just listened to him and asked questions and made him feel loved and accepted. And so sometimes, you know, those kind of things will be some of the most powerful quality moments that we will have with our children at different ages. So to end off our class today, there's a really fun article. Turn to page 158 in our cottage meeting manual, Four Tricks to getting your family to the table because that can be hard. I get it. As the kids get older, their schedules, their sports, they work, blah, blah, blah. And it's just going to be almost impossible to get everyone home at the dinner hour kind of thing. And so at the top of page 158, it says, a Harvard study found that something as basic as eating together consistently fosters many wonderful things for families. And then she lists four tricks to getting your family to the table. And I'm telling you, moms, I have done these tricks and they work. And when I don't do these things, Dinner hour is not always successful and it doesn't always happen that we eat together. So the very first thing she recommends is that you announce, you get in the habit of making a morning announcement to everyone before they leave that day, what the menu is going to be. We're gonna have chicken and rice casserole with homemade cherry pie for dessert. See you dinner tonight. Or we're gonna have, you know, uh, I don't know, sloppy joes. And, and she tells a really cute story actually in in the manual in the middle of uh, page 158 that she was coming home from work one day and she saw two little 10 year old boys in her neighborhood just pedaling their bikes like mad and she rolled down the window and she said hey guys where are you going so fast and uh, the little neighborhood boy said hi miss Os Os osborne it's sloppy joe night tonight at home and we got to get home for dinner and i've invited uh my pal Kevin and pa and Kevin shouts out that's what I'm talking about I mean they were so motivated to get home because they you know the sloppy joes were on their mind so I did that with um the food nanny if you go to uh, she has a little website and you can print off her template Monday Tuesday Wednesday and you and I would write down I did this for years I would write down each day and I I pay I tape it on the refrigerator so the kids could actually see the whole week you know, uh, what was going to be for dinner. And I would try in our little morning prayer in the morning and devotional before I'd send them off. I'd tell them tonight, we're going to have, you know, dad's famous spaghetti bolognese sauce with peach cobbler or something. And so it just gave them that little extra incentive that, 
I'm not just going to pick up, uh, you know, a burger and fries on my way home. I'm going to wait and, and eat with the family because they now have been thinking about this for the whole day. And so that worked. I, I swear that worked with my kids. And then the second t- uh, tip was to set the table. It sends a message that the dinner hour is important and those coming to the table are special and that they deserve this extra effort. And the author of this uh said she didn't have a lot of money when the kids were little, but she'd always try and put candles on the table and light the candles and then have little paper napkins and and neatly folded underneath with, uh, with real forks and real glasses instead of plastic. And, and, and even she'd get some cheap little place place mats from Walmart and I would set the dinner table. And when she worked, she would set the dinner table in the morning before she would go to work. What a, what a great idea. And as the kids got older, they, that was a part of some of their chores to set the dinner table that night. And I have done that too. And the kids, when they pass by that table in the afternoon and they see it all set, it builds anticipation that we're going to you know, we're going to have a moment. This is going to be kind of special. The candles are going to be lit. The third thing is so funny, but it is so true, is you have to have food aromas going on in the house. So even if what you're making for dinner, there's no aromas, she recommends just get an onion and fry it up and freeze it and put it, but that the kids can smell the food in anticipation that dinner is coming. And so um, she said she had one little kid that like turned from Dr. Jeff, Mr. Hyde when he got hungry. But if he could smell that it was coming, that there were sounds and smells coming from the kitchen, that was just enough to keep him, you know, from from losing it and from raiding the, the potato chip bag or whatever. And it just kind of calmed him down. Those food aromas create an anticipation of what to come. So yesterday... Uh, I had leftovers and so I pulled everything out of the refrigerator and I'm heating it up and there was like zero anticipation because there was no food aroma and everyone came into the kitchen and I hadn't set the table I just had them get their own plates and it was a lackluster experience but when they can actually smell for like a half an hour 25 minutes something coming from that kitchen they just naturally I don't have to yell and scream to you know get them to the dinner table it's just a completely different experience and then lastly have some fun traditions one mom would put an almond in her tapioca pudding uh, once a week or one of their desserts and whoever got the almond or the quarter in the cake would not have to do one of her chores for that week. One mom would write little notes and put them under the plates of the kids. One mom would give the names of the um, things they were going to eat, fun names like headhunter stew or chaka rocka daka chocolate cake or razzmatazz ravioli. So these fun little things really do help. They help gather the children. They help have them, you know, be excited. They, they just know that they're going to have a, a special experience for, you know, 20 minutes or half an hour. And then imagine if you pulled out your little conversation starter and asked them a fun little question and have an engaging conversation, they're not going to want to miss the dinner hour. And if you start the, this tradition when they're a little bit younger, as they get to be teenagers and have these schedules, and sometimes you'll have to adjust, you know, your times instead of eating at five, you might have to eat at seven and so forth. But, but they will know that this is uh, a high priority in your family to eat together and the power that comes together from discussing that day and the problems and discussing what's going on in the world is powerful. So what are, one last question before we finish up today. What are some of your meal traditions that you have in your home? What are some of your meal traditions to, to bring children together, family or grandchildren together over food? We have family dinner every Sunday usually my oldest daughter she lives right up the street her and her boyfriend and she's very very busy she I mean she she has about five different uh in different income streams so she's she's always busy so I always you know try to make something that I know she's gonna like so I can bribe her to come over I shouldn't say bribe because she likes to come over but it's, it's hard because Sunday she does her grocery shopping, she has to do a meal prep and all this stuff, you know, for the week. 
So last week I knew it was going to be really busy for her. And sometimes we have dinner pretty late. It's never a consistent time. So the night before I made um, beef bourguignon. So I thought, well, I'll be ready early Sunday for her. So she texted in the morning and she's like, well, I don't know if I'm going to make it by, you know, because I'm, I'm crazy. We've lost track of time. And I was like, that's fine. I said, I've already made it. I said, so why don't you just do a drive by and just come pick it up, you know, and you can warm it up and eat it at home. So that's what she did. And uh, so it's just having to come over for a few minutes just to get that. I still got that connection with her. And it's just nice. It, you know, she told Brielle the other day, she goes, because usually when she comes up, comes in, the first thing she does is raid the pantry or the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And she told Brielle, she goes, you know, if I don't eat something when I come by, it's not a visit, you know, so she's, she has to come by and go in there. So, you know, sometimes you, you, I love us to being able to sit down on Sunday and have a meal together, but I understand because she's so incredibly busy. So it makes me feel even more blessed when she's able to take those few hours out of her Sunday afternoon and come over and spend it. So even if you can't, you know, have that traditional time, like I was able to plan ahead and still get her to come over and have that, you know, that short little visit. And I cherish that, you know, I, with older kids, it, it's, it's very special when they make the time to come and see you because they don't have to versus when your young children are at home and, they're hostage. They're, you're going to get them to the dinner table. Mm -hmm. But to have your adult children take that time is is just so very special to me. And I, I try to do whatever she wants on Sunday, her, her boyfriend. You know, what do you guys want to make so I can make sure right. that, you know, they, they're even more incentivized to come over and have dinner. And usually we play games after. we have. That's like our family game night is on Sunday. You know when they when they can put in the extra time to do that. So there's I, something about the power of food to help gather people in, and when p people are gathered in, is when they feel the spirit of your home, and then you're able to better teach them. But oftentimes, that food is that powerful incentive to get them to gather, and then you can teach. And so, so true. Anyone else? What are some traditions that you have around? Meals? I have some traditions that started a long time ago when boys were in college. Uh, that's when the rage was cell phones. They had to be on their cell phone. Everybody had to be on their cell phone. So one tradition we started that at the dinner table, there were no cell phones. And at first they thought, hmm, you know, okay. But they got used to it. And I remember one day that in another tradition we had was that they could invite anybody they wanted. We always had enough food. So if they needed, you know, a, a person that was rooming with them, a person that were the friends. And to this day, they still invite people that are in town and have a, don't have anybody. So that was another tradition. But one particular time, they invited this uh, sister and brother to come to, to dinner with us. And so the young girl took out her phone at the dinner table. And so one of my boys said, oh, put it away. We don't, uh, we don't have cell phones at the table. And her facial expression was like in shock, I think. And I thought, I kind of giggled to myself and I thought, I bet that if she was riding in the car with her brother, she would have left. <laughs> because it was so important for her to have the cell phone. So that's, that's another tradition. What we do now, because they come to, not so much during the pandemic, but uh, other times, uh, Sundays was a good time, or Saturday nights when the, they let me know we want to get together, and it'll always be at, it was always at my house. And one thing I do is I make a new dish. I make a new dish, and then I have them rate it. Oh. Okay, they have to rate it. Do you like it? And they did not want to hurt my feelings. And I said, no, 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 no. Now it's going to be yes or no. Because I need to know whether I need to make it again. Because they have, I make, have made lasagnas for them forever in high school. They would, they would invite 20 to 25 kids over. So I knew I had to make a lot of lasagnas. 
and in college the same thing. Uh, they were involved in different groups, and one of my sons brought, you know, I think there were 27 of them, but they knew, and our house wasn't that big, but everybody sat somewhere and outside and all, and so they knew that they could invite anybody to this day. Yeah, it, I love that. Be food. They can always anticipate something new, and they get a say whether it's a keeper or a. <laughs> That's great, and yeah. that really made it was fun for them. Yeah, and it was fun for me because there are times of times when I try something new and I don't care for it, but they love it. Yeah, and you so they would know. rate that. They still do that. They'll right. give me a great thumbs up idea. or a thumbs down, and. And we're good. So those are kind of, to me, fun things or traditions that started some time ago that make a difference now. Yeah. You know, we do that too, Sandy. We don't allow any electronic devices at the table. Yeah. You know, it just, that's dinner time. You know, it's, yeah. you, can there, put your, you can put your phone away for, uh, you know, for a few minutes to have a meal. That's One thing that my family does, um, especially with, I, I have millennials, but we live in different states. I have one in California, Idaho, and Utah, and I'm in Texas. And so what we've, what my daughter proposed was uh, that we make the same meals together on the same day and we plan. So we made, um, she made ratatouille in Utah and I made ratatouille here. And then we would share our you know our displays with pictures and how it looked how it turned out and you know so it, it draws us a little bit closer together um even though we're so far apart yeah so that's, that's a fun idea anyone else um julian to talk a little bit about the millennials that that you kind of mentioned on with your nephew um we too have a millennial and she is gosh we love her to pieces we do but she has been a real trial for us um, but what I have noticed that I think worked throughout our time with her as a parent is that we consistently showed our children that we love them. And I would put notes, I'm sure all moms do this, but I would put notes in their lunches. I would put them in their drawers. I always just letting them know how much I love them or their dad loved them or how proud we were of them. And as they all began to move out, we would have them put their things in a little box. They had a little area that they could store them in. And as I was going through them not too long ago, do you know I found those notes in each of their boxes? What a simple little thing that we do just to let our kids know that they mean so much to us. And um, that millennial has had a tough time, but like your nephew, she is beginning to see that things that are happening in the world, just something's not right. And they're good kids. They are, this is millennial ages. They are amazing individuals. They just need, I think this, this is what I've been studying. This, oh, what, yeah. They, they, if they could talk pitch, about that, next have year. that and go through that, I think they would see what an individual, one individual can do to change the world. And, um, so anyway, I didn't mean to bring that in, but I just think it's important that those little tiny things that you mentioned on these simple principles that we put into their lives, that we love them, right. just a little note makes a huge oh. difference. And, and that's where we're sowing these seeds that we hope is going to bear some fruit, but it takes time for that little seedling to pop through the soil. And so we do it on faith, that faith in God, that he will magnify these efforts, these little simple things that we're doing in the home. Well, I loved, I loved your comments today and for this discussion. Truly, everything that we worry about as parents and grandchildren, from drugs to alcohol to promiscuity, obesity, academic achievement, even good nutrition, can all be improved by the simple act of eating and talking together around the dinner table. Just think of all the disputes that could be settled, the dreams that could be developed, the virtues that could be nurtured, the relationships that could be fostered. If we took the time to sit down and have dinner together as a family, we could solve so many problems ailing our nation right there at the dinner table. A nation really is nothing but a magnified family in home. And so I love this last little quote by David O. McKay that says, the home is the first and most effective place to learn the lessons of life, truth, honor, virtue, self-control, the value of education, 
honest work, the purpose and the privilege of life. Nothing can take the place of home in the rearing and teaching children and no other success can compensate for failure in the home. I love that. You know, mothers and grandmamas, it is worth our best efforts in our home. These simple things that we do day in and day out and maybe even at the dinner table of all crazy places where we sow these little seeds of strong families and a love for each other and God and our country. So thank you so much for being here today. Next week, that book that you held up, Lorene, The Making of America, we're going to talk about that book because we're going to talk about woo, how do we teach our children the Constitution? You do not need to be a law school graduate. You do not need to be a constitutional scholar to know how to teach these beautiful principles in the Constitution. I'll show you how I did it in my home for years, how easily it can be broken down. There's nothing intimidating about it. Mothers and grandmas, you will be the best teachers your children will ever have. You are the most qualified to teach them all things. And I'm going to show you how you can teach something that might be feel a little intimidating to you. Uh, we're going to take the, the fear out of teaching this beautiful document, the Constitution, to our children. And so, and I'll show you some of the books and resources that, that I've used that have been so helpful and so easy. I mean, I learned the Constitution right along with my children. I didn't particularly know any more than they did. We learned it together. And so this will be our discussion next week, and we will see you next week.